It is a significant day in our presidential history. Joining us tonight with some insight, former member of the Ford administration and political director for President Reagan, Ed Rollins, syndicated columnist Miguel Perez, and author of the book Building Red America, Thomas Edsel. Welcome to you all. I want to first start with you, Ed, because uh, you knew this man, worked for him. You were on the Hill uh, during his administration. Can you give me any kind of sense of what kind of a man he was, maybe even an anecdote to help illustrate? He, he, was, he was a very decent man. He, he, there, there aren't any Jerry Fords around today. Uh, uh, probably a Denny Hastert comes the closest in the sense of someone who's well loved by both sides. Uh, he, uh, he he was he was not a not he was a partisan, but not a partisan in the sense that uh, uh, that he that he fought you day and night. Uh, he was more in the the Bob Michael John Rhodes and, and Ford was certainly the, the leader of that. Where you fought all day and at night you went out and you socialized and you and you didn't uh, you didn't make enemies. I think he's one of the most beloved men uh, that I've known around Washington. Uh, and and I think decency is the word that most people would use. Uh, 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 he, he was a man of real courage and integrity. Uh, I, I don't think anybody ever questioned his his word was his bond. And on the Hill at that point in time, that was very, very important. Sort uh, of an icon in the, of the greatest generation. When you look back at sort of his resume, you know, a father and a, a patriot and a Navy officer and a congressman reelected 12 times. Um, you know, you say they don't make them like that anymore. Well, it, you know, maybe they do, but you don't. You don't. Uh, you don't see them. They, they they came up in a different way. I mean, you you know, obviously many of these were the World War II generation who went off and served their country. They started in local politics. They weren't multi-million dollar campaigns. You didn't go out and hire campaign consultants. Uh, you basically sort of did it yourself, knocking on doors, uh, uh, running in the local uh, local order. Uh, this was a guy when he was the when he was the leader went out and campaigned a couple hundred nights a, a year for uh, for his fellow uh, members of Congress, uh, which is sort of unprecedented, asking for nothing more than to help them get elected. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, uh, it created tragedy in his own family and his and his his wonderful supportive wife. Obviously, uh, developed an alcoholic problem be because she wasn't there all the time, and and they made that very public and they they resolved it. They they were ordinary people who who rose to the highest uh, job that he never sought and I think served this country right. very, very well. We bring up Betty Ford and that's interesting because it was sort of part of his legacy. Uh, the first, I guess, of that generation to kind of be public about what I guess a long time ago was considered a personal weakness, and she sort of brought it out and said, "No, this is an illness that can be treated." That's also part of, part of the the legacy, I think, of this president. Not only she was just as courageous as he is, as he was, uh, and uh, I, I was uh, in college, uh, just finishing my, my graduating from college as he took over as president, and I I learned to admire the man. In the beginning, when he pardoned. Uh, Richard Nixon, I was outraged. Right. And later on, I, I came to realize that he made the right, he was right and I was wrong. It was the right move. He healed the nation. Uh, imagine what we would have gone through in this country if he had not pardoned Nixon, uh, the prosecution of a president, what image that would have taken, uh, cost for us around the world. Uh, he was a healer. He was uh, selfless. He was a very, very honest man, just the right man at the right moment. Thomas Edsel, we keep hearing the word healer all day today. We also keep hearing bipartisanship. This was a guy who could battle it out with, you know, another legendary personality, Tip O'Neill, on the floor of the house, and then, you know, go and have a beer that night or even, you know, pick up his kids the next day in the family carpool. Uh, is that spirit of bipartisanship, uh, is it gone? Is it, is it, could it come back? Was it remarkable? Uh, well, really what uh, he did was to set the stage for a much more partisan Republican Party. His defeat was really the defeat of the remnants of the moderate wing. He had picked Nelson Rockefeller as his uh, vice president, who he had to drop. Uh, he set the stage both by his defeat being a setback to that moderate wing, the Rockefeller wing, but also it put a Democrat in office at the worst possible time. Jimmy Carter had the gas shortages. He had uh, the hostage crisis. He had inflation rates and in interest rates up to 19 percent, and all that was perfect ultimately for the election of Ronald Reagan. So he was a very significant transitional president from one kind of Republican Party to another. Ed, when you look at those names, uh, you know, in the in the Ford administration, the Ford era, a lot of them are here today. Did he? Um, I guess help raise up the current the current. Well, he did. I mean, obviously, Dick Cheney was someone who came of age. Uh, he was a very young uh, intern uh, working for for Rumsfeld uh, uh, at 31, 32. Was the deputy chief of staff. Became the youngest chief of staff at 33. Uh, 
uh, you know, was a very professional man. Uh, Rumsfeld, obviously, Bush, uh, so even though he had been a minor player in the uh, in the Nixon administration, really took a, a more major role as the CIA director uh, under under Ford. Uh, I think one of the key things, uh, and, and 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 not to take issue with Tom. And Tom's a very dear old friend of mine. You can uh, take issue with it. <laughs> we've taken plenty of issues in the past, but the the bottom line is, I think uh, I think Ford was the last of the centrists. Uh, uh, he, he supported civil rights. He supported a lot of very important things uh, that Republicans uh, uh, were known for, uh, more for the Midwest Republicans. Uh, Reagan was more the, the West, uh, the Goldwater heir. But I think the key thing is, is uh, and where he was very unselfish, is he could have held off for two or three months and not issued the pardon. Uh, the political thing to do would have been to wait till the uh, the 94 elections had come and gone. Here was a guy who had a 78% approval rating a month after he was in office, but he chose to stop the process and to move on uh, by by pardoning him in in uh, in, in uh, September. And his party, which he loved, I mean, it had been a mm -hmm. man of the house took tremendous, lost 49 seats in the House, including his seat that had been held by Republicans forever. Uh, and so I think the bottom line is he didn't do what was political, he did what he thought was in the best interest of the country. And that's a, that's a big step forward. We could use a lot more Republicans like Gerald Ford nowadays. Uh, you know, I missed a moderate Republican. I think we, sh we need them, centrist. We need, uh, we need well, maybe, maybe in 2008 we, we may have one or, one or two running for president. But, you know, that, that move away from, uh, from moderate Republicans, that move toward conservatism really hurt the nation, in my opinion. Uh, and also, you know, having lost to Jimmy Carter, I was not an American citizen mm. when uh, Jerry Ford ran against Jimmy Carter. I would have voted for Mr. Ford, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, he gave way to the worst president, in my opinion, that, you know, in my lifetime. Jimmy Carter, in my opinion, was a terrible president. So what did we elect, uh, well, you know, when we got rid of Jerry Ford? I think it's regrettable. Tom, let me ask you a quick question about, I guess, the presidency there and the decision-making. And maybe Ed is a good person to close out on this. But, I mean, could a president today make the kind of decisions and have the kind of an Oval Office uh, that he had then? Is, is it much more consensus-driven, much more poll-driven now than it was then? Has the presidency changed since Jerry Ford's day? Oh, it's tra changed tremendously. A president would has, has a much more calculating staff. Uh, the whole operation is guided by political strategy. There is not this sense of a president being the healer of the nation or the, the father of the nation. There's much more he is the chief political operative or political agent of, of his political party. So all that has changed very radically under, uh, since, since Ford was there. One of the great things Ford would do is when Ford was campaigning, he'd call up a bunch of his old cronies, uh, his friends on the Hill. He'd say, come on, I'm going out today to campaign in Colorado. And they'd get on Air Force One and they'd have a nice lunch and they'd have a couple martinis. And, uh, uh, he, you know, he'd say, what's going on on the Hill? And uh, he'd go out and unfortunately, sometimes when he had a martini or two, he'd talk a little longer than he probably should. But he didn't care. I mean, he, this was who he was. And he wasn't about to be programmed or, this, or he wasn't about to be driven by, by uh, pollsters or any of the rest of it. Ed Rollins, Miguel Perez, Thomas Edsel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Still ahead, the results of tonight's poll and more of your thoughts.